uh, unpicking those finance barriers really key to progress in the deforestation issues. Hey, sir, you've been conducting research into how to fund energy efficient projects. Yes, my research has been mainly focusing on trying to identify the barriers that have uh, been uh, faced by the industry of the financing energy efficiency and also to try to see what are the possible solutions of addressing such barriers. Uh, for example, the International Energy Agency uh, estimates that about 13.5 trillion US dollars are required in the next two decades to be able to meet the two degree uh, scenario, which was also the one that was agreed upon at the uh, COP21 meeting in Paris. Um, and uh, uh, as such, I, uh, my, my research looks at how, what, are some, what are the key barriers and how can we overcome them. And it uh, inspires uh, one of the way of uh, overcoming some, some of these bar barriers are inspired by one model which is, uh, has been introduced in 2013 by the uh, solar uh, project developers, which is also known as the Yield Co. Uh, now the Yield Co is, uh, the, the proposal in this case, is, uh, uh, is, is proposed to be able to tackle two main, two main problems problems that are the, the current f uh, financing mechanisms uh, 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 are uh, the, the problems that are, are faced with the current financing me uh, mechanisms. Uh, the first one is the, uh, the balance sheet limitation and uh, in that case what happens is that in, when, when a private uh, company undertakes energy efficiency projects, uh, eventually after building a set of uh, portfolios it will f uh, face a certain uh, balance sheet limitation and that is because there is a lack of secondary markets, meaning that the investors, there is no place where investors can sell that portfolio of loans to be able to undertake more projects and they were free, therefore free up capacity. And the second uh, uh, important barrier is that um, uh, because such companies are usually are, are private companies and they fi fund themselves uh, with uh, short-term corporate debt uh, and the business model as such that they have, they are not the best uh, long-term investors to be able to uh, hold up, uh, uh, energy efficiency projects that have payback period of 30 years, uh, 20 or, or, or up to 30 years. And we, we see such long-term uh, uh, payback uh, periods, especially in projects, for example, that have that deal with deep refurbishment. And deep refurb refurbishment of buildings is a very important sector. Uh, and as a result, we see a bias in that in, uh, private investors uh, uh, would choose, would select projects that have a shorter payback period. So the idea from this was the, pr the, the possible solution in the paper, in the research that I propose, is that the possibility of implementing such a yield co concept, whereby a private company, an energy service company, an ESCO in this case, or any other similar entity that undertakes such projects, would be able to sell, to, to transfer such operating projects to the yield co, which, which, which is an entity that is designed to only hold operating projects. Will, you presented research today regarding the loss of forest due to subsidies. Could you tell us about that, please? Yeah, um, in the same way that ASA is interested in energy efficiency, I'm interested in the emissions from land use and forest loss. I think to some extent a lot of the barriers faced by um, the energy efficiency sector are very similar to me. You've got very distributed stakeholders, millions, billions of farmers, hard to aggregate. Um, it's not really a product that... Um, uh, people that give loans are typically acquainted with, they feel a bit uncertain with investing in agriculture, just like they don't quite understand what investing in energy efficiency is like. Uh, and similarly, high upfront costs and very long payback periods. Most take a plantation crop like cocoa or palm oil, they take four or five years to mature, and then they you can harvest them for 20 or 30 years or something. Uh, so f f f un 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 uh, unpicking those finance barriers is really key to progress in the deforestation issues. What I'm actually looking at is the kind of foundation to all this. And my research has been saying before we create finance mechanisms that solve these types of problems that I just described, we need to look at the underlying forces that shape the market. At the moment, people are incentivized to deforest. What is the range of government policies, existing financial um, incentives, um, other types of kind of 
regulation and policy that shape the current uh, agricultural markets as, uh, at the moment to incentivize people to deforest. So we looked at, for example, the beef and soy um, uh, kind of value chains in Brazil, palm oil and timber in Indonesia, and we kind of found a, b a bunch of kind of subsidies and incentives the whole way along those value chains um, from access to land through to um, incentives and subsidies for processing and you know, distribution um, that really kind of set the market in a way that currently uh, incentivizes deforestation. So that might be cheap fertilizers, it might be building ports, it might be kind of tax relief on like tanneries or leather processing or um, factories. So kind of all these different types of complex government policies that ultimately incentivize um, the, the behaviors that we're trying to kind of get out of our economy. Elizabeth, you've been looking at the performance of coal companies in regard to developments in coal capture and sequestration. Can you tell us about that, please? Um, yes, we looked at uh, a sample of uh, um, nine um, North American companies that have about um, over two billion in um, market value. And uh, we looked at um, how the investors view uh, positive and negative events with carbon capture and sequestration and um, um, with looking at different events. And um, we find that the pos there's very positive reaction to uh, positive events, but no reaction to negative events, um, which is kind of unusual. And, um, and um, we test a hypothesis that um, investors have already put the stranded asset risk um, into their, their stock prices. And we see that, for instance, for our sample, there was a 92% drop in coal prices between 2011 and 2015, which suggests that um, most investors think that carbon sequestration isn't going to work and, um, and that um, they're revaluing the companies lower. Where do you think that money's going? Um, well, I think a lot of the money's, hopefully some of the money's going to alternative energy with uh, pension funds and there's a lot of divestments um, for ethical reasons. So um, hopefully it's going to renewables, well, I hope. <laughs> You've all looked at the effects of money on the climate, uh, all from very different points of view. As far as you're concerned, where do we stand at the moment in regard to money, the climate, and energy efficiency? I Is it a positive outlook? <laughs> I think definitely it's a positive outlook, and uh, we just had the pleasure of uh, uh, hearing about the new uh, study by uh, UNEP uh, FI on the uh, inquiry and about the, the, the financial system. And uh, as uh, it was mentioned, that we're experiencing a slow revolution i believe it mm. was it was referred to uh, so i think we are definitely heading in the right uh, direction and we see a shift of focus um, uh, towards more uh, green uh, green uh, climate to climate finance but generally greening of of the financial system so to say uh, but what i i feel is that we that a lot of actors are getting together and i think generally there's they, they are beginning to ask the right questions. I think I agree with that positive outlook broadly. Um, this slow revolution at the international level, freeing up the, you know, the trillions of dollars that exist in you know, the kind of banks and the insurance companies. I think on the ground, um, there's a lot of the perennial problems we have about getting to the people that need finance. Um, it's, you know, for me in the agriculture sector, it's very, you know, there's a long standing kind of problem of getting investment and capital to poor farmers and understanding what collateral they have uh, and what kind of knowledge they have to access that finance. But um, I think we're getting there and I, I know that the, the actions that are going to benefit them, you know, their well-being and their welfare are going to benefit climate in the long run. So there's a kind of good synergies to be had. And then in the middle, I think there's a lot of people really looking to kind of develop policies or financial products that work. I've just come back from a week of research in Ghana, and there's a really big movement there about investing in sustainable timber plantations. There's a huge demand. There's a global timber gap. Um, it's just about getting the finance from the people like Geneva, where it might be, understanding 
learning kind of uh, like how to free it up like policy wise and uh, kind of instrument wise on the ground so um, yeah you know bu bubbling along ticking along and a really strong policy signal like we had in Paris that every country in the world's in it and um, you know, we need to kind of look to things like energy efficiency and, and kind of emissions from land if we have to t you know, work on all angles. I think that's really strengthening the situation we have. I think the financial institutions are doing a great job. And for instance, yesterday, um, JP Morgan Chase and Bank of America decided they weren't going to um, finance coal activities. Um, because of the damage fossil fuels, but I think at least in the U.S. I think we need a carbon tax that a lot of companies, especially um, big fossil fuel companies, are hoping that there'll be some energy breakthrough uh, that doesn't look like it's coming. And so um, if we have a ca carbon tax, that would be a big incentive and also incentive to try to make energy breakthroughs. <laughs>